to my interlocutors for that. Uh, that's what the exercise is about, hopefully. Um, or realizing why you're right, but I happen to realize why I was wrong about something, which may be even more profitable. So now we're going to have a, an hour-long conversation about um, journalism and censorship. And I am proud to be speaking to and moderating this conversation with Jacob Brugman. He is a fourth-year PhD student at Johns Hopkins University who studies modern political economy and intellectual history with a focus on technology, policy, and media in the 20th century U.S. And he's a graduate fellow at the American Institute sorry, Melissa, for Economic Research, um, where he's an, an associate editor for Fusion Magazine. Um, Professor Sorens, you are actually going to be on the next panel. Oh, uh, that's great. <laughs> but, but thank you, thank you for making it. Um, and I'm also joined by Billy Minion, a graduate of the University of Virginia. Um, shout out Juliet Wahua. Sorry for the inside innuendo, everybody here that has no idea what just happened. Um, Billy is an associate editor at Reason, where he writes about criminal justice and government accountability, among other topics. Um, and he was a 2022 to 2023 Robert Novak Journalism Fellow with the Fund for American Studies, along with my friend and submissions editor at National Review, Jack Butler. Um, again, those last comments were kind of for these people who are friends of mine who may be watching in the future. Um, okay, so without further ado, please give it up for our two speakers, and I'm going to begin asking them questions. Sorry for all the confusion there. You can tell that I don't normally get my mind changed on substantive things, and now I'm all out of sorts, which reflects poorly on me. Um, so I'm just going to get into the questions. Yeah. So, to what do you attribute the increased interest in government intervention online? I'm going to start with you, Billy. Um, I think... A lot of censorship efforts today boil down to a misconception about what a journalist is. And when I say that, I mean, I think that there's this idea that journalists are kind of a protected class. It's like they're some special group that um, are credentialed or you're on a payroll, you know, with the New York Times or some fancy magazine or whatever, and that makes you special and have a certain, like an additional bolstered spe free speech rights, uh, which I just think is totally absurd. Um, Anyone can do journalism. It's not, uh, you know, I don't consider myself like a doctor where I, you need like an actual license to safely practice your profession. If you have a phone or a computer, journalism is the act of sharing information. Um, of course, we can agree or debate rather the best ways to do that. Um, but I think it comes down to this idea that social media essentially kind of democratized sharing information. And I think it has really freaked some people out, the idea that Anyone can really be a journalist and put their voice out there. Um, and there are obviously, like Nadine was saying this morning, there are you know, negative effects of that as well. Um, but I think it is fundamentally incorrect to assume that you know, if, you, if you have a job at a magazine or a newspaper or a TV station, that you're in some sort of special elite class. I, think that's, I just think that's false. Yeah, I really like that answer. So for me, when I think about this question, I often think about it as a historian. And when I begin to think about why states or governments care about, uh, let's say, intervening in the information ecosystem, my first thought is, well, power always has cared about information. So you can go back to the colonial period when um, colonial governments like policed the letters that were being sent from plantations to um, even among sort of the, the sort of um, like ruling class of the plantations, right? Because they were fearful and trying to monitor what information was being shared to keep their fingers on the pulse. Like, of course, that's very different than the social media age, but I think we gotta begin with the premise that governments, authorities, have always been interested in information, to some degree controlling information, at the very least monitoring. 
Now, again, as a historian, like what's new about this period? I think in the 1980s, especially, um, with something called electronic bulletin board systems, which some people here maybe participated in um, in that period, they really democratized, it's the first step really to democratizing people contributing to, writing, sharing information in the way that um, Billy's gesturing to before social media. And you had a ton of moral panics in the, late, in the late 1980s and 1990s, in the US specifically, about what kind of information was being shared. You had copyright um, uh, pan sort of panics in the United States, thinking about people illegally copying software and other art forms. In the 1990s, you had a moral panic about pornography and other sexual content being shared on these very decentralized networks. And so I think there are reasons to say there's a new, there are new dimensions to this issue, certainly like in the 2010s and the social media era. I think there are clear like overtones the government's making to um, sort of preface new interventions. But I ultimately go back to this point I'm trying to make, which is this is a very old problem. And I think something libertarians can do more about is, is think about old solutions to this problem. So how did people counteract government intervention in the past? Sure. So Jacob, you brought up new circumstances that are motivating new forms of government intervention in the uh, dissemination of information, you know, broadly the speech space, although this has gone on you know, since the dawn of man, you know, since the beginning of time. Um, but it does seem like, you know, and I guess perhaps for me as a libertarian, if he grudges me to admit this, but not really, um, you know, nowadays, you know, uh, what, what is the, the saying? You know, a lie, or, you know, spans the world before the truth gets its pants on, or yeah. <laughs> there's some saying that goes something like that. And, you know, in times of crisis, like during the COVID pandemic, people disseminating lies about um, misinformation, disinformation, maybe you guys can help me understand and our audience understand those concepts, if they're substantive and substantively different from each other, uh, that's kind of a, a tangential question. Um, like, it, is there a proper motivation here for some well-intentioned people in government or outside government to say, hey, you know, it's a bad thing if people choose to not get a life-saving vaccine or take life-saving precautions or do things to minimize negative externalities to like our fellow man during during emergencies it seems like at least the motivation there is um, you know can be benevolent so I think okay I don't know if anyone is familiar with what's called the Streisand effect okay so my musical theater friend yeah. something um, was named after Barbara Streisand, and essentially a few decades ago, she, and I have a point with this, I promise. Essentially a few decades ago, she was trying to get people to stop taking pictures of her California mansion. And in her efforts to stop, like, to censor that material, it blew up, and now everyone has seen her California mansion. Um, so I think the question is essentially, you know, are there reasonable efforts to take down information? When you look at the data, I mean, sure, someone's intent can be good, and someone can want... Uh, there is some information that's legitimately bad, but I think that oftentimes it actually has the exact opposite effect, and then everyone sees that information, and that theory actually spreads further. Another example I would add is uh, when Twitter was still called Twitter, and they tried to uh, censor the New York Post story about the Hunter Biden laptop and people's um, DMs. I think that story was probably the New York Post most read story of the year, because then everyone was like, what the hell, I have to read the story. And so, I mean, I think we're seeing like a big backlash to those efforts, especially in a time when very few people trust the media and uh, very few people trust the government. So, like I said, I think these efforts can be well-intentioned, but if the goal is to counter bad ideas, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a particularly powerful route to take. Yeah, I would, I would add to that, which is that if we're going to try to envision some intervention at any level of government, local, state, federal, maybe international. What makes the most sense to me is what Nadine was suggesting this morning, which is renewed emphasis on sort of media literacy, right? So how do we equip consumers of information with the right tools to discern what is bullshit from what is not, right? Or what is um, sensible take, a sensible take or a reasonable point somebody might stake out on an issue from outright miss or dis or malicious inf uh, information. Um, I think it's really hard to do that in practice, but 
Um, my suspicion is like we could treat it something something like um, you know we treat education generally, and we could build it into infrastructures that already exist rather than trying to envision new wacky kangaroo courts that you know moderate um, these things that professional journalists, journalists like Billy and others are doing, and um, that bloggers are producing. So I think looking at the individual level to me is where it would make you. Don't add one thing, please. I remember I wrote a story a few years ago when the theory was circulating that Bill Gates was trying to like microchip people with the vaccine, um, which I do not subscribe to that idea for the record. Um, and I talked to this man who is uh, an expert on conspiracy theories and how they spread, and he essentially said that when you have a news article, like of course CNN, the New York Times, whatever, ran so many articles that were like this conspiracy theory that I will now explain for you in grand detail is wrong. And a lot of people don't trust those institutions, so what happens is more people subscribe to the theory. So he, he was saying that the best way to counter things like that is to be a positive information. Instead of saying, no, comma, this is why you're wrong, um, just feeding them the, tr the truth. I, obviously, people will disagree on what the truth is. But feeding them positive information instead of trying to you know, correct the record in a way that a lot of people just don't trust anymore. So instead of worrying about censoring this and misinformation, getting Information out is is perhaps the right a better a better tact. Sure, and um, okay. yeah, that makes sense. Um, but since I'm just ignorant of these two terms, and we have a, a historian with us, perhaps uh, Jacob could take a, uh, perhaps Jacob could take a, a strike at defining disinformation and misinformation. Yeah, so um, I'm going to fail at this strike, but I'm happy to uh, step up to the plate anyway. So these terms, there are people out there who have, you know, journalists and academics who have kind of written about them, written about where they fall short, and I think there's an emerging consensus that these terms don't necessarily get us where we want to go. But in the last decade, maybe, and um, Billy, I'd be curious if you add to this, I saw the definitions and uses of uh, disinformation being maybe intentional, um, purposive, maybe even resulting from like malicious intervention. Uh, basically, information designed to confuse. Misinformation, on the other hand, I understood um, as sort of like incorrect or, imp or um, partial information. So, uh, you know, that might be like early debates in the pandemic about masking, right? Which was we just didn't really know um, what the effects of that policy were. There were counterclaiming, um, counterclaims to the actual science, whether it was effective or not. So there was a lot of, like, I would argue, misinformation about masking in the early pandemic period, right, um, on all sides. Like, we just didn't really know the full picture. I, would, I think it's a different thing to say there was disinformation in general about masking, maybe later when people are saying that masking was sort of like a government plot uh, to suppress the people. Some libertarians may hold that view, but I think that, um, you know, that is maybe a helpful way to tease out the difference. So I think Dartmouth libertarians, for the record, good, I can good. speak on behalf of the club, <laughs> which maybe I can't. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think in general, people, people have started to understand that these terms don't necessarily get us to where we want to go. And one way I like to think about this is, a, is something is um, from public health friends who say that we should think about information and information asymmetries in the way we think about public health. So, um, like your poor, a poor health may not be um, the result of something inherent to the person, but lack of access. So you can think of information access in the same way. Like, and this is to Billy's point about more information, right? Um, giving people access to the right kinds of information, creating channels to share that information or tools for individuals to help figure out what is the right kind of information for themselves. Not to say like, you know, they're relatively just choosing, but I think that's a helpful way to, to move beyond it. And so the public health people have actually offered some interesting criticisms of those concepts. Yeah, well, what would be an example, and this is to both of you, um, for such a tool? For example, I see a lot of civil libertarians, whether right, left, or anywhere else, tend to be a fan of I guess it, it would now be called X notes. Right? Community notes. Community notes yeah. on X, formerly known as Twitter. Are there other interventions like that? Um, or, or what are some that you have in mind or were alluding to, Jacob? Billy, if you have. Okay, so ideas. when you asked for an example, the first thing that came to mind was actually community notes. I think it's, uh, I'm not a big fan of Elon Musk, to be honest, but I think if he made one really good change to that website, it was taking the idea of a fact checker and making it less of like this elitist person on high and actually like 
giving it to a wide subset of people with many different types of views. Uh, I think that, I mean, I, sometimes I see the community notes on there and I just, I, I think they're far superior to the fact-checking notes that you see on Facebook or uh, the previous version of Twitter. I, you know, something I was thinking about earlier is when we're talking about misinformation and disinformation, some of the stuff that was flagged on Facebook as misinformation turned out to be true. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest issues when you put that tool in a really small group of ideologically driven people, almost always on the left, uh, you're going to get kind of perverse outcomes. I would just add to that, um, one thing that Community Notes is doing really well is kind of reintroducing a feature that was very common in the pre-social media era of internet activity, that's the era of these bulletin board systems of the 80s and 90s. And that was the era when you had community bulletin boards, right, on special interest uh, topics that might be gardening, it might have been white supremacy, it might be like communist thinking in the United States, right, they were extremely pro um, uh, different and diverse topics on uh, bulletin board systems at this time, and they were all moderated by somebody who would elect themselves or be elected to the position, um, generally because they created the bulletin board system or people had confidence in them. They were called system operators, and they kind of policed the community norms, um, and in this way decentralized the way that information was governed. So rather than what kind of Billy was alluding to there about like having a real centralized authority saying this or misinformation or banning people, you had very localized networks of people um, and operators and sort of moderators, right, who knew the people who were posting and had a closer tie to them. Um, there are a lot of people right now at the MIT Media Lab and other places trying to invent new social, kind of create new social media platforms that operate on that level. So um, I think Deb Roy at the Media Lab is about to come out with an app, which is a debate app, um, which is based on these like 10 to 20 person groups talking about issues where you have one person in that community kind of doing this moderating. And so I think devolution is better but when yeah. it comes to these. Well, I guess I'm not surprised to hear that this kind of concept of subsidiarity and private governance is one that libertarians in the audience, and I guess online, you can watch this later, will be familiar with, and perhaps later on, um, Professor Sorens will talk about federalism. I know that's one of his, I, I, fiscal federalism, but still federalism nonetheless, it's analogous to, to what we're talking about here. I'd like to harken back to what Billy said about um, largely left-wing ideologues I guess at organizations like Snopes, although I'm not sure if they're the best example these days, I'm not sure, um, that are doing this censorship. Um, that's true, but I think largely also in journalism, and doing good journalism at prestigious institutions, which may even still merit their prestige, and I think many of them still do, at least to a large extent, are largely you know, moderately left-wing or, or significantly progressive. And I'm wondering, as a you know, libertarian in the in journalism, um, and I think this also applies to conservatives in journalism, you know, why are there so many more Democrats, progressives, leftists in kind of institutional elite professional journalistic outlets and censorship groups? I think it could probably be traced back to the university setting. I mean, you know, academia is largely left-leaning, and that produces people that, I mean, because journalism is to an extent academic work, it's research and writing and um, analyzing the world. Um, and I think, I mean, if there was like, if you actually had to trace a through line, I think that would be a big reason. But I also think that we're seeing the pendulum start to swing back, because if you look at metrics for like, you know, what content creators on social media are going the most viral every week, it's almost always been Shapiro. It's almost always, you know, uh, so yeah, there are several, you know, X Fox News personalities that now are doing their own podcast and that sort of thing. Um, Matt Walsh is the other guy that comes to mind, who's, yeah, in, whatever you think of him, he gets a lot of traffic and engagement on his content. And I think it's because people are trying to, like, find a corrective to what has essentially been, I guess you could say, monopoly control of the press, ideologically speaking. Um, and I think a lot of people, of course, Something else, another trend I feel like I'm seeing is less produced content. I think people now think that if they see some like fancy video in a studio or something, they're like, this person's up to something. And they, they, they have a, another, another motive. 
Um, whereas some of the videos we make at Reason, they specifically told me like just stand in your living room and like hold the phone. And I still put on my ring light, so you know you can't see any wrinkles or whatever. But um, <laughs> but that people are relating more with that kind of content because they feel like this, this institutional thing that you're saying. They feel like they've been lied to, and I think a lot of these people have lost a lot of these media institutions have lost trust for that reason and legitimately so. Yeah, I could add to that. Um, I think there is a pendulum swing going on. Um, I think you, if we're seeing a lot of new ventures from libertarian and sort of general, maybe center right. Barry Weiss's Substack just got named like the number one publication on the platform. Right, and then is, is that the, separate from the free press? That's, um, so that's her stuff, yeah. Yeah, so press. like all these things are proliferating, there's money pouring into them. But I would also suggest, I think the um, environment, the landscape, is not so bad. Um, like if you look at any of the uh, legacy publications, the Wall, the Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal, it's definitely more right-leaning, but look at the Washington Post, look at the New York Times, like these places, as left critics always allege, have more people on the right than they should, They should, like according to the left, right? Um, so you have Connor Friesendorf, Megan McArdle, like Christine Emba, that's, you know, the Atlantic at this point, generally, I think, is pretty center-right on a lot of things. Yeah, and they, are, they just announced they're profitable for like the first time in... Surprise, they're catering to the majority of American. Uh, right? um, so I think like, I, you know, this is part of my attitude, which is one that like our institutions are really strong and I think they're better at synthesizing things and, um, you know, balancing than we often would like to admit. Um, just one book that I'd recommend, um, Billy's comment kind of sparked this. I love this scholar, Neil Gross, who wrote a very interesting book called um, Why Professors Are Liberal and Why Conservatives Care about this as Billy was suggesting, like the pipeline from universities to journalism. And he points out in that book that a lot of the lack of conservative or libertarian um, sort of ideas in higher education, by extension, um, if we're going to buy this argument, maybe journalism or other sort of like knowledge economy professions, a lot of that comes down to self-selection. And there are a lot of complicated reasons for that, like these professions appear to be professions of the left which you know, leads the whole genre of people to say, I don't want to you know, play ball with that. But this is to say, um, like Neil Gross has a ton of different arguments about why it's not outright discrimination, it's self-selection out of these professions. And that's, again, like that's a reason for us to be pretty optimistic. Like we can build alternative pipelines, we can encourage people through funding, training, mentorship programs to be part of those institutions, to take the next step. Um, and so I, would just, I just wanted to plug that because that's a book that in the libertarian conservative world doesn't get read. It's, it's definitely academic sociology, but it's a great read. So um, leave it behind. Yeah, uh, I'll also say that journal, the idea of journalism as this elite profession is actually kind of a new concept. I was yeah. just about to Right. So it's a, it used to be a very working class profession where you, you know, mingled with your community. It did not used to be like... And I also went to an elite university, so I mean, it did, but it didn't used to be like this pipeline where you had to go to a fancy school and you know go straight to a national publication. I feel like it used to be not only working class, but you started with like a little paper, mm -hmm. and then you got to another paper. Um, and just the the business model has changed because the business model in media is constantly in flux. Yeah. Yeah, about this business model and the incentives at play, because um, you guys kind of have the funny remark about. You know, the Atlantic now has more right-wingers than it used to. I didn't realize that. I thought it was still like a left uh, publication. Um, and it's, you know, profitable for the first time in a while. I mean, ultimately, you know, regardless of what your ideology is, if you're a journalist, you care about being hopefully somewhat independent in your evaluation of the facts of the matter. Um, so how, and I guess this question is more to Billy, how as in a journalist with an ideology, an ideology I happen to share, this is a Dartmouth Libertarians event. How do you handle those things which are seemingly, you know, potentially in conflict with each other? Wanting to be independent in your evaluation of whatever topic you're covering and maintaining your value commitments. Sure, I actually don't think they're in contention at all because I think that there is a difference between being unbiased, which I think is like a really silly concept because everyone has biases, and the idea that you would be unbiased. I mean, it's just like. I mean, it's, just, it's patently absurd, um, but that's different than being fair. So there's a there's a fine line between being objective and fair, and I think that every journalist, no matter what your ideology or view is, whether you're writing opinion articles, as I do, I know that you, that you both do as well. Um, 
I think we should, of course, always endeavor to be fair and to not like misconstrue what someone actually said to us. I mean, that happens all the time in the press, where someone will be like, I said that, but not in that context. You know what I mean? So that kind of stuff is indefensible. Um, but I think that you can, those things can exist at, at once. And I also will say, I think that we would be better off if more news outlets were willing to just be like, hey, here's where I'm coming from, so you can understand and proceed from there. So, you know, Fox News saying they're fair and balanced, and they're not. And it's okay. Yeah. Um, just admit it. The New York Times, I mean, they also like to claim that they're unbiased. No, you're not. Just admit it. Uh, I think that would engender more trust. Uh, Barry Weiss would be a good example because she does not, she claims to be like a center left liberal. No one thinks that she doesn't have thoughts and opinions but she is just honest about where she's coming from and that has given people more of a reason to trust her. Yeah, and another example that comes to mind and it was just reported on in um, Barry Weiss's Substack is NPR. And so NPR had this sort of like mid-century role, right, of you know, claiming to be this unbiased sort of organ of the news, right? Um, there's somebody recently interviewed on, on Weiss's Substack who was a producer for like 25 years, I think, and describes in his own career what he perceives as the public losing faith in NPR. And that shift for, in his eyes, and this reported on in the free press, came when NPR started, when NPR's claim to sort of like just reporting the news came into conflict with its editorial decisions, right? So like, what are you covering? What perspectives are you covering? Um, that's very, like I still listen very actively. It's very clear that they care about some issues more than others, right? Um, it came into conflict and, and sort of clearly in this uh, producer's mind when NPR started to feature more pieces that kind of like delve more into commentary rather than news. And this is a great piece in, in Weiss's Substack, which is basically this one guy's lament of the fall of this institution from like mid-century kind of liberal press, like media institution. The BBC is another one that maybe is actually like held on to, in British society maybe. Um, to more of its sort of like neutral guys, but NPR, I think it's fair to say, for many people has lost that guys. And um, this producer, this employee sees it, locates that change within the very recent past, right? With the coverage issues and with the um, tone of NPR's reporting, which, which has changed. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you describe it as a guys, and I think perhaps Billy and other people, perhaps yourself, I think I would as well, argue that this pretense of objectivity is exactly that and has always been that, and it really is just a guise. So is the solution to, um, you know, kind of give up the ghost on no-nonsense, non-ideological, unbiased reporting and instead just be upfront about reason? You know, it is the magazine of free minds and free markets. That's what we believe in. National Review, a small government conservative magazine. Um, Mother Jones, communist, etc. There's no, but aren't they explicit about that? I mean, these are you know publications that are explicit in their ideological commitments, um, and it seems like that is beneficial to the extent that um, people trust them because they're they're honest about where they're coming from. But does that does giving up the ghost on kind of unbiased, unopinionated, um, or maybe underopinionated outlets? Uh, is that conducive to the rise of like epistemic bubbles, um, echo chambers, and and the like? I mean, I think it's a good thing if you know, even though you're libertarian or or whatever we are independently, you know, you seek out, you know, what's the NPR take on? What's the center left take on this? What's the far left take on this? What's the center right? What's the far right take? But that seems to me a little bit optimistic. I, I will admit that I'm not going out of my way to read Mother Jones articles on X topic. I mean, I, I say this as I'm much laugh. I'm biased, uh, um, but like I, I, the idea of being unbiased, I just, I've never bought that. Even reading from organizations that claim to be biased, or it claims to be unbiased rather, um, no one really believes them anymore anyway. You know, we, they tried that for, you know, for so long and they've lost the public's trust. I will also say that the, um, the idea of unbiased news was actually kind of a recent invention as well. Like the Walter Cronkite, and that's the way it is, was like a, a new for its time. You know, muckraking journalism in the 30s and that kind of stuff, I mean, that was extremely partisan yeah. and very inflammatory. 
Um, and of course, do I think that there is the chance that people will kind of you know, self-select and filter bubbles? Yes, but I think that's going to happen no matter what the press does. People are going to have views, and people like being around people who think the way they do. Do I think that that's kind of boring? I don't want to be around everyone that thinks the same way I do, because, I mean, that's not very spicy. But, like, it's, it's not surprising that, you know, family units or, you know, people with their romantic partners, whatever, generally look at the world the same way. I think people kind of self-select that way, and I think that's going to happen no matter what. I think a lot of this comes down to, in some ways, how much we value professional ethics. So you think about medicine, right? I know we have there are medical professionals in the audience somewhere, right? Like there's an idea about health, and there's this ancient creed, the Hippocratic Oath, right, about helping the health of the patient. When, when journalism was professionalized, um, which again, as Billy's pointing out, is a recent phenomenon, there was this idea about public service or public knowledge, right? Like doing something for the public good. Um, there are definite antithesis for this, like before the post-war period, but it maybe reached its peak in the Cronkite era. And I'm willing to sketch out some terrain for people to say, I am doing this for the public good, even though you might, you know, I know there's some Randians here, like there's no such thing as public, we are not living in a society, right? We're just individuals. That's fair enough, you can take that point. But I think it's important for professions and professional organizations, and I think we're often well served by those organizations having some idea of their purpose. As in medicine, where the idea of a patient's health is very controversial right now, and topics touched on earlier in the breakout sessions, I think, regarding like you know, trans issues, right? In journalism, this is a very controversial idea, right? Um, and it's maybe no surprise that these sort of like professional creeds are being challenged, right, as professions themselves are facing uncertainties in the future, right? Like it's, un, it's unclear what the fate of professional journalism is as the media landscape fractures. It's maybe to some other extent unclear what the fate of professional medicine is, right? With all the new technological and maybe AI-aided types of diagnosis. So we're in a moment of just incredible flux. And I think in this moment, in this historical moment, this old version of organizing society and knowledge, the professions, is coming into contact and clashing with um, new ways of organizing, I think, in particular in the digital world, where everything is a lot more um, decentralized and chaotic. Now, that may be, I'm kind of speaking from the clouds there, but I think that that can't be underestimated, like to, to the degree that this is an old type of organization which is now being challenged by just new ways of organizing. So I don't know. I don't know if anybody has pushback on that, but that's kind of. I'll add one thing, um, since this is a group of libertarian leaning people. Um, the LA Times recently laid off like a hundred some people, which is a massive yeah. layoff for, for a journalism organization. Um, it was like some crazy, it was like 15% reduction in their staff. The business model for journalism is changing, and so part of that is going to be, you know, the ad revenue stuff. I mean, like a lot of that stuff is just on its way out the door. But there is also at least a part of it that people don't want what you're selling because people aren't buying it. So why is that? And I think that that should prompt self-reflection, and it rarely does. Which is why I think you see people who are pivoting to these other organizations. And you know, I was covering, I'm covering a case and making a documentary about this woman. She's a fascinating person. Her name is Priscilla Villarreal, and she lives in Laredo, Texas. And she calls herself La Gordi Loca. So for people who know what that means, it means the crazy fat lady. Um, so basically, she just goes to crime scenes and live streams them from her phone. And she upset law enforcement because she can be kind of antagonistic toward them. So they arrested her, and it kicked off this very interesting battle in the Fifth Circuit, um, a battle which she lost, and is now appealing to the Supreme Court, which is kind of bonkers that that could happen in the United States of America. Um, but it did, and the line from the ruling that uh, dismissed her case was the, it was a judge who said some, made a distinction between her and mainstream legitimate outlets. That is her, word-for-word you know, word phrasing, which, back to my first point, I just think is the silliest thing I've ever heard. What makes an outlet mainstream and legitimate, especially in an era when no one wants to buy your product? So, that's my spiel. Yeah, to um, go back to something that you said, Jacob, you were kind of expounding on the changing technological landscape that journalists and journalism is operating in. You invoked AI, and there are all these layoffs, perhaps 
AI has something to do with them or not. I'm not sure I didn't read about this. Um, but I know that Reason, for example, uses AI to narrate its articles, often in the voice of the author or Catherine Mankey Ward. Yeah, Moore. Catherine Mankey Ward. Yeah. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if you guys can prognosticate uh, to the extent possible, do you think that you know, AI will be uh, a substitute? Will it be a complement? Are there some ways that it's unacceptable for it to complement your work? For example, uh, and this was brought up in another conversation, there's a tight link, uh, and this was actually with Nadine, between speaking and writing and thinking. And so for example, and I got permission from my Econ 65 prof to do this, when I was coding for uh, my final econ class, and you know I had ideated the regression I wanted to run, but I needed to do some data. I promise this is going to connect. Wanted to do some data cleaning in Python. I used ChatGPT to help me engineer that, right? And I'm not, I wasn't being evaluated on my coding performance. I'm not a comp sci major. I was, being co I was being evaluated on my you know economic analysis. So I used it to help me like that. Uh, and then similarly, I like writing because I like thinking for myself. Right. And I'm wondering, you know, so I I tend to think that. Uh, AI does not have, should not have a substantive role in the production of your op-ed, your, your writing. Uh, and I'm wondering if you guys disagree, if you use AI in a more substantive way in your writings, maybe in drafting and bouncing ideas off of it as like an interlocutor. I've tried that with philosophy, it's, it's not good in that regard. It struggles with like meta-ethical questions. But, you know, maybe it can have a better, more complementary role in journalism. The only time I've really used it, and I write about a lot of, so he's criminal justice issues, but it's a lot of complex legal issues and I'm not an attorney. So, I mean, there have been a couple times where I've been like, can you explain this, like, complicated legal concept? And it, like, spits out some relatively digestible explanation. I think that there will always be a market, though, to hear from other people and what they think. I don't think, I, I just, I... Per my thing on climate change earlier, it's not that I don't believe that climate change is a thing, for example, I just happen to believe the world is getting better. So I think that there will always be a market for hearing what people think and engaging with ideas, and I don't think people are going to want to do that from like a computer. Um, but I think it will just make that kind of coverage stronger, like whether it's helping me understand a legal issue or, I mean, there are many different ways it can come down, it, it could come down. I and mean, I think the only thing it might like fully replace is like very basic breaking news type stuff. But no, I mean, I think people like engaging with ideas. I don't think that's going to change. I hope you're right about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with the sort of cautious opt or optimism there. So I think, um, I think two things. The first is on a personal level, I sort of shudder at the idea of using this for my writing, right? Because I'm one of the, you know, and many of us are, like, we, we, we live in the world of ideas, we like to write, writing is our craft. And so, you know, I'm like, oh, woe is me, woe is the university when I think about, you know, people using this instead of learning how to write. But I, I had a piece on, the, um, on this in the Martin Center last week. I think academics in particular, like, overestimate how much their interests translate to the interests of the population. So, like, yeah, for a lot of people, like, especially if you didn't really learn or to have a love for writing or because of the screwed up educational system, you really didn't, you know, perfect your skills. Like, this is great. And in fact, I have a lot of, like, ESL student, this is making a great difference for them. I, I like green light for them to use it as long as they come in and talk to me. Like it helps them, um, you know, learn to do that, learn to write, learn to you know think more clearly. I think for you know a lot of different contexts, it can be very um, you know actually liberating. I think so. That's like on the personal level. I feel some ambivalence, but I'm seeing uses for it proliferate, which I think are going to be um, you know significant on a more like meta level. This is kind of where I think a classical liberal perspective, if you will, is very helpful here. Because like, I may shudder at the idea of this tool changing the way, to your point about what Eve was saying, like the way we actually think. Right? We're no longer iterating in the same way on the page. But this goes back to Plato right, and the Phaedrus. Right? And I am very skeptical that there's some like, essential quality to thinking which is unchangeable through time. Like back then, Plato, uh, in that dialogue, right? Um, there's a deep skepticism that writing, instead of memorizing, would like alter your ability to think and be a human person. Um, this is the same thing with photography and painting, right? So there are always these moral panics about what a technology means for like the human person. Those are very important debates to have. 
but I ultimately have to sit back despite some of my skepticisms and kind of you know sit with like a Hayekian perspective. Like this is evolution. Like this is, I think it's getting better. I think the world's getting better. I don't know how this is gonna turn out. I'm confident in our ability to guide it in some way. Um, and uh, let's see where we go. Like I'm buckling up for the roller coaster. So oh, that is a wonderfully optimistic note to open up the floor to questions from the audience. How'd you like that transition? <laughs> good. You don't really want to hear me continue speaking, so you know, proffer some questions, please. Professor Swartz. All right, so one of the big debates going on now is um, should we be pessimistic about local and state politics because of the kind of local journalism? So I wanted to Get your take on that. Are there solutions to that, given the, the marketplace today? It's an interesting question. I, you kind of saw this with the Washington Post, which used to have like a really, which used to be like a good local paper, very robust local coverage. Same thing with the Washington Examiner, and they both scaled up and went national. I think it's one of those things where the business model is just so in flux. Like these hedge funds are buying out, uh, you know, Gannett, which has all these local newsrooms, for instance. And uh, if it doesn't meet the bottom line, then those jobs, I guess, tend to go away. An interesting model of, that is promise is the nonprofit model. I'm not just saying that because I happen to work for one. Uh, but like the Texas Tribune is doing really well uh, because they're. A, supported by a group of people uh, that those people aren't influencing their coverage, but they are financially making sure that they keep the lights on. So you can tell I wasn't a business major, but um, that kind of gives me hope. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the nonprofit model is working in Baltimore where I'm based. You have the Baltimore Oh, Baltimore Banner. Yeah, that's, that's a good publication. And there's, you know, it's, it's doing really well. But I think this is an opportunity to put an asterisk on my optimism, right? Because in the early 2000s, as these papers were getting scooped up by Gannett, um, where I worked for a little bit at USA Today, right? they like devoured all these local papers, cut the metro sections. And then every reporter was writing like six stories a day, and they're like, I'm quitting. Yeah, they're quitting, right? And, but pe people had this, a lot of techno-optimist types had like a refrain, well, Facebook, Yelp. Uh, Twitter, then Twitter, right? These are going to approximate some of the functions. Facebook groups, right? They're going to approximate some of the functions of those local papers. I think that's happened in some ways. Like, you know, there are community bulletin boards. Like, I joined the Great Barrington one in my time up at AIER this semester. There's like a ton of cool stuff, some weird stuff going on there too, right? With these Facebook groups. But it's very clear that those, all these alternatives did not capture the full function of those papers, right? And so, um, and it's also clear that, that apps and these platforms themselves are not designed to facilitate the sort of like positive social outcomes that came from those papers. Like learning about Joe Smith's daughter graduating or learning about, you know, that guy from two doors down getting the silver heart in, in the war or whatever. Like those types of information sharing mechanisms are not being, you know, approximated in the digital platforms. Instead, people are watching reels of whatever the heck, based on the algorithms that uh, you've, that, have, uh, that are based on your, your research patterns. And so I think, you know, there is a real, uh, I don't know what solution, where this leaves us, but I think that like the 2020s are, we're seeing the sort of aftermath of the collapse of those um, papers, and we're seeing how these digital platforms just really aren't doing the same job, like even Nextdoor or Citizen App. Right. Like, there's been a lot of reporting on these. These are, like, super, I mean, I think that they do certain things well, like, you know, their community bulletin boards and whatnot, but they also, like, make people really scared about crime when there's yeah. just no crime. So I think, like, we're just, we, we haven't, like, figured out the optimization for these things yet. I hope we do, but I, I think I'm, I'm skeptical that we have a real solution to the absence of those papers these days. I'll have a tiny comment. One thing that I think is interesting, and I don't know if it makes me optimistic, is that a lot of local stories are becoming national. Like, if there's some crazy thing that happens in Alabama, like, am I right about it? I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, though. Mm -hmm. Mariana. Um, the truth about, uh, about publications being honest about their biases, and you for the nonprofit model, uh, makes me wonder what is the line between journalism and propaganda? Can we define propaganda, either Mariana or? One of our two speakers. See, propaganda to me is one of those words that I just feel like has lost all meaning. Yeah. Because propaganda used to mean 
the government, like like Hitler used a lot of propaganda, you know, like, to get people to join this horrific movement. Propaganda now, I feel like, like I have left-leaning friends who say I write propaganda just because I write ideas that they don't agree with. Um, so it's kind of one of those things where I just. I don't really, ex I don't re really accept the, the premise, I guess. You know, because if propaganda just means any ideas I don't like, which is kind of how it's interpreted today, then there's then pretty much every news organization is publishing propaganda. Yeah, just to add on to that, I mean, all writing should attempt to be persuasive, right? And if we're at a, a point in this in society where any attempt at persuasion is propagandistic, I mean, we're screwed. Right. Um, yeah, what's the alternative to persuasion? <laughs> uh, oh, that's a tough... Uh, coercion. Coercion, right? right? So um, totalitarian coercion. I, so, I mean, I don't know. Propaganda is very particular to, like, the mid-century period, right? That's when that kind of word took force, and it was sort of, like, intentionally um, designed media, often with the aim of stirring, like, citizen or consumer sympathies to like the state or specific political cause. I think like we're a long, like we're, the current media landscape is a very long stone's throw away from like the Google's ministry of, you know, uh, whatever the hell in, in, the, in the right, right? I mean, I think we're just, I, I think there's been a, like to Billy's point, a, a real dilution of that term in the past few, few decades. And unfortunately, I think the Trump era really like But that. I will say to that point, and bear with me here, one of the things that kills me is when journalists take government press releases and just <laughs> reword them and then publish them. And to me, that is more propaganda. It happens on the right when there is an administration they like. It happens on the left when there's an administration they like. And you know what? Public relations pays more anyway. So if you want to do that, you should just go into PR. <laughs> and libertarians are never guilty of this because we hate all the We hate every all the yes. So it's fun. I have to admit, uh, not that I'm one of the speakers here, but I, this is just going to be a funny remark. I actually took a course in the philosophy department last term called propaganda, and I cannot define the term for you afterwards. So I'm not sure if that's a, if that reflects poorly on me as a student, poorly on the concept, or poorly on my professor. Probably some combination of the first two, and I will not um, accuse my professors of being anything other than great pedagogues. But, you know, you guys can also question that. So, um, a final, uh, any more questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, what is your Oh, you mean like with paywalls? Yeah. That's a fair point. It's hard to say. I mean, because every business has to make money. Um, it's one of the reasons I will say that I like the nonprofit model, because Reason doesn't have a paywall exactly for that reason. It's just supported by people who believe in what we're doing. And like I said, they don't have any editorial input, but they're also making sure that like they can create a robust team and that like, you know, we can still operate the air conditioning. Um, Which is important in DC in the summer. That's true. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I would just reemphasize to start that like they are not the same thing, right? I, like I think academic knowledge at its best. I mean, there maybe next panel we'll hear about some of this, right? It, it it's not maybe this anymore. It's it's the production of new knowledge, and uh, the sort of like course of scholarly debate that is for good reason not always going to be interesting to like a journalistic reader, right, or like a reader of a sort of like one of the week, big weekly magazines. Journalism has a function in scooping, interesting, and, it's, and it often comes down to the individual writer, right? Like there are great writers for magazines like Smithsonian who like, you know, troll nature and other big um, sort of academic publications, and anytime there's a really interesting study, transform it into sort of a more readable, digestible um, piece, and there are people who you know do that in journalism, but I think it there's no like necessarily there's not necessarily a mandate for journalists to do that. Um, in my field, history, we often say that journalists are they off, they offer the first draft of history. 
Um, I think that's generally true because what historians do then is wait after a certain wait for a certain period while the events sort of are digested in society, um, perspectives accumulate, and we try to take a step back and metabolize all those things and offer an interpretation. And that, you know, histor history is written sometimes by journalists, it's consumed by broad publics in many cases, but the sort of production of history is separate from journalism by design, um, even though there's a relationship between them. I don't know if that's answering your question, I think it's very tricky. Um, that's sort of a, a broad answer, I think, to the specific point about access. Um, this goes to a very interesting question about copyright, which we were talking about earlier. And I think um, we would be all better served if these academic journals started to move toward open access and other things where you know random folks on the internet or random readers could access like JSTOR, right, without paying like whatever it is, probably thirty thousand dollars a year for a subscription, right? Now, I'm sure it's something significant. Um, so anyway, I'll stop there because I could, it's easy for me to ramble on this subject, but I think they're different. Um, but you know, they have a they have a relationship. The difference isn't, you know, trivial. And we have time for one last question. Misha. Um, I want to ask about the relationship between, like, journalism and, like, poli political roles. Because especially in authoritarian countries, like, there is, like, a very, like, hard, like, hard line is because, like, the like, government is, like, very aggressive. And, like, journalists, some, like, sometimes kind of like, start to take, like, a political role. And so, like, what's, like, the edges of this, like, where is this, like, line to be drawn for, like, when you're a journalist, when you're a politician? So what's the line between being a politician and a journalist just for the So I think this is actually a really interesting question because people are starting to, to notice the revolving door between like MSNBC and the Biden administration. <laughs> um, and that is also a revolving door like Dana Perino, who I, I like. I, you know, I think she's a nice person. I think she's good on good on camera. She was a press secretary for George W. Bush. So I mean, I think it gives people a sense of where they're coming from, um, and I think that honesty and transparency is important. But I also, to be honest, I thought it was really rich when Ronna McDaniel got a contract at MSNBC, and it literally became a news cycle because all the cable news hosts on that channel were acting like the sky was falling, and it was like, to, it was. It became a news cycle in and of itself, which I think is honestly a reason why a lot of people aren't watching cable news anymore because they just don't care about that kind of thing. Um, and it is, an, it is an interest that really only affects people of a certain elite sort. Um, but I, to me, I think it's good to hear from lots of different type of people with lots of different type of experiences. Um, and so whether or not someone's worked in government or not doesn't really bother me, but I, as long as you are you know, challenging your viewers with different voices, uh, which is a problem for a lot of these networks. All right, that's going to wrap it up for this panel. Could we give the two speakers a round of applause?